Father in heaven, we ask that you would speak to us through this message. Guide us, we pray, in your heavenly name. Amen. There is an elderly man who's wife of 60 years had fallen asleep and he couldn't wake her up. This was um, about 100 years ago in the rural part of the country. So they were just going to bury her. They get a pine box and the family comes around and for three days they sit vigil. And then they put her in the box gently. They rise her to their shoulders and they're walking out of the house with the pine box and it hits an edge of the wall as they're walking out, a corner of the door. And the lady pops up, and she starts to breathe, and it turns out she was alive the whole time. She had just been in a deep corner, and the hitting of the edge jarred her alive. Everybody celebrated, and, and the old man took his wife back, and for another five years, she lived healthy. But this time, uh, she passed. And same thing, the three days they spent vigil watching over her, they put her gently in the box, put her on their shoulders, and as they're walking out, the man stands up and yells, watch out for that corner this time. <laughs> Why is it the married people are the ones that are laughing the loudest? <laughs> the moral of the story, even though it's a little off color, is that the things that die, we want to stay dead. The things that die in our life, we need them to stay dead. Paul. Um, the early Christian let's start back here. The early Christian church has just started growing by leaps and bounds. They are being overcome by the mass amounts of people they have, and so they decide to set up administrators to help them pass out the food. Okay? The biggest issue they had were with widows. And the church, because uh, they sought to uh, elevate themselves into heaven's living and not earthly living, they saw widows as being important. Widows in the Jewish community, in fact, the entire Middle Eastern community at that time, were almost worthless. See, men had the greatest value. Uh, then sons, okay? Then women, but only, only as they related to how they could serve men. Okay? When a husband died and left a wife, Without a son, she was in dire straits. She couldn't own property a lot of the times. Uh, most of his estate would pass on to his brothers. She had to work tooth and nail trying to get something. Most of the time she wouldn't remarry because uh, men were a little queasy about being with someone they had already been married. They think that, well, they're gonna, uh, the, their original husband's going to get all of the um, credit for their children. And so it was, it was a very a rough situation for widows. The Christian church said, no, they are the most despised in our society. We're going to uplift them. We're going to take care of them. And they tried their best to take care of them. But there were some issues with the Greek-speaking Jews getting their portion of the allotment because the Hebrew-speaking Jews were getting more. So they appointed men to help take care of that. The first presidents of the church were administrators, were deacons. And the greatest of those deacons was a man by the name of Stephen. Stephen was powerful in work and in deed. He uh, not just uh, served the needs of the people, but he showed what Jesus was really like, what God was really like, by the way he treated people. And he spoke wisdom and knowledge and power. The Jews had had enough of him, the ruling Jews, the Sanhedrin, and so they brought him in to give a test to Moni as to who he was and what he thought he was doing. And this is where we pick up the story for today. Acts 7, starting in verse 52, and we're going to be reading all the way through Acts 8. Okay, Stephen goes off and he gives this entire speech. He paints out the entire history of the Jewish people. Okay, and how every time God has tried to save them and come to them and give them salvation, they've rejected him. And he says, I said, God sent you prophets, and you killed those prophets. God sent you men to foretell the coming of the Messiah, and you killed those men. And then starting here, verse uh, starting 51, you stiff-necked people, you uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one. 
and now you have betrayed and murdered him. They're talking about Jesus. Whom you received the law that was put into effect through angels, but you have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see heaven opened up and the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. The, this, by the way, I just want to point out, is the church, okay? These aren't just, you know, a mob of ruly indi unruly individuals. This is a church group. Dragging him out of the city, they began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees, cried out, and said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. It begins with murder. Because there, 8 verse 1, there was Saul, and he was giving his approval to Stephen's murder. On that day, great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged out men and women and put them in prison. Saul has all of a sudden become someone who doesn't just give approval to persecution, but he is persecuting the church with every chance he gets. He's on his road to a town called Emmaus to persecute more Christians. There's a church leader down there, Barnabas, who I'm sure is terrified. And on his way, Paul is walking along and a great light appears. And Paul gets knocked down to the ground. And a voice comes from that light and says, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He says, who are you, Lord? I don't know who you are. He says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, and you are persecuting me. By the way you're treating my children, you are persecuting me. He says, now get up. And I'm going to show you a new way. On that day, Paul, Saul died, and Paul was born. The Bible says that each of us will have to give an account of, for the faith that was in us. You see, when we come face to face with Jesus Christ, one of two things happen. We reject Jesus and try to murder him, or we reject self and murder it. You hear what I'm saying? When you come face to face with Jesus, you will either reject Jesus and try to murder him, try to go after all the things that Jesus loves, or, or you will reject self and try and murder him. It. Do I have any Christians in this house? If I do, let me hear you say amen. amen. Well, if you're a Christian, then that means that you have chosen to murder your flesh, murder yourself. There are three things that are needed to be convicted of murder from my uh, time in law school. If you can't have one of these three things, then murder doesn't take place. They can't accuse uh, or convict you. And the question I have for you today is, if you were brought into a court of law, would you be able to be convicted of murdering your flesh? So you need means, you need motive, and you need opportunity. And those are three things we're going to talk about today. The first thing, do you have the means? See, when Paul was Saul, the means that he used to persecute the people were jails and stones and whips. 
See, the world has its means from day one on how to persecute those who do not agree with it, who do not see eye to eye with it, who are not one with it. And what I find crazy is not that the world does this, because, listen, we're all living in a time right now where the world's going to persecute Christians, okay? I mean, we, 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 I just saw today, it's a little aside, allow me my, um, I'm not tight yet, I haven't gotten back to my, my routine, so just allow me to go off on my little tangents. You don't mind, do you, Danny? All right, good. Everybody say, hey, welcome, Danny, welcome home. Yeah, great to have you, girl. Um... I just saw in the news recently, I don't know when it happened exactly, but it's been the last month or so, uh, there was a man in Canada who opened up his church for people to worship him. The government said, shut down. And he said, I can't. This is a sanctuary for people to come and worship God. You know, I can tell them to mask up, I can tell them to social distance, but I can't deny them. Now, whether you agree with that or not is one thing, but what I think is crazy is that he was just arrested and sentenced to six years for trying to worship God. This is not the Middle East. This is not uh, uh, China. This is not Russia. This is North America. If you don't think persecution is coming to a uh, movie house near you soon, wake up. It's coming. But I don't worry about that stuff, to be honest. The world will always seek to destroy what's not like him. The problem I have is when the church seeks to persecute its own. When the church are using the implements of the world as means of persecution. So the world uses not always stones. Sometimes they're stones are rocks, but many times the stones are hearts and words and behaviors. The means of the world are hearts that ignore suffering because they think, well, those people deserve it after all. Well, I'm sure there's no one you know in the church who's ever felt that way about someone else. Like, oh, you know, she, uh, she cheated with me and my husband. You know, now, now I don't want her to get the cancer, but now that she's got it, you know, the Lord sees. Sure, it's never happened. There are words, uh, the stones are sometimes words that, that gossip and tear down and belittle ones who are different than them, who don't agree with them. Sometimes it's behavior that makes another person feel small. And these are all stones the enemy uses to persecute God. If you are using these in your homes, in your workplaces, words to tear down, hearts to get solid or, or cold, behavior which belittles, then chances are you haven't killed your flesh the way you thought you had. So what are the means that God uses to murder self? Well, it's one main word. Anybody want to guess what that word is? I said, does anybody want to guess what the main method, the main means that God uses to murder the flesh in us. Well, it's one word starts with L and ends with love. See, God uses love. Love murders all of the things that, 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 that claw at us and seek to break us. Love murders the emptiness and the fear Love murders the shame and the hurt. Love isn't just jealous of others. Love uplifts others. If you're feeling yourself and you've noticed that you've become, you've started using the means of the world and that yourself isn't quite dead, I invite you today, I call on you today to use the means of heaven and let love fill your heart. And the ones that you've been gossiping about, maybe praise instead. Maybe uplift instead. The ones that you've been nagging, maybe uh, tell them how great they're doing. The words you've been used to complain, maybe use to praise instead. This, this is what God calls us to. How do we know that 
this is what God wants? Well, in Matthew 25, 40, he says, The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. See, one thing I found is that we cannot have a living, growing relationship with God if we are using means of persecution on his children. If any people that disagree with us or any people that are different than us or any people that kind of just irritate us, you know, we feel justified in tearing down, we're not living in heaven's realm. We're living in earth's realm. And the flesh hasn't died yet. Paul's hatred of Stephen was not just because he was theologically different. And maybe this will help you understand why you get so frustrated with some people in your life. It was because Stephen's life showed what true followers of God was supposed to look like. It showed emptiness of Paul's style of worship. Often we find ourselves angriest at those who show us our hypocrisy. And it's easier to tear them down than to change ourselves. I remember when I was born, I was the perfect child. Oh, it's true. That's my mom. I was a strapping young baby boy, full of energy, you know, and everything I did was perfect. That's my mom. But then the enemy came into the picture. About four years after I was born, my parents got uh, careless, okay? Um, and, 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 you know, weren't thinking one night, you know, whatever. You know, everybody makes mistakes. And I had a baby brother. And I remember, you know, I was four years old, so I'm old enough to kind of understand things. And he came out, and he was nothing like me. He was broken. Okay, well, I had, you know, sturdy, brown, straight hair and a rooty complexion. He was soft and round and had light, fluffy, yellow curls and big eyes. And his eyelashes wrapped all the way over his head. <laughs> and when he, uh, see, when I, but before, when I would run into a room and I, like, grab something, up, everybody be like, oh, Timmy, you're so cute, huh? But all of a sudden, people weren't mentioning me anymore. They weren't even acknowledging me. Oh, look at the baby. He's so cute. He didn't do nothing but cry and poop. Well, I take that back. He never cried. He was the perfect little child, and I despised him. I never forget one day I was bullying him. I was using the means of the world. I had to use every chance I get knock him down a little bit, you know, mess with his brain. I remember one time I said, hey, bro, you want to play spaceship? He's like, oh, okay. Well, come on, we're going to go in the spaceship. And I opened up the dryer. I'm like, get in. I was a bad brother. And he was like, no, I want to tell mom. I maybe check with mommy. I'm like, you're such a baby. You got to check with everything. One time he was sick. I said, oh, mom said to take this medicine. It was hot sauce. After a little bit, my dad had enough, and he pulled me on the side. And he said, son, that's enough. I said, what? He's always, says, no, no, he's my son, too. He's my son, too. Now, to me, he was irritating and, and a goody two-shoes, and I had every reason in the world to treat him. See, I don't know if you know this or not. How many oldest children do I have in here? Okay, 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 yes. We have a God-given right to do whatever we want to our younger siblings because they deserve it. Can I get an amen? But apparently, I was like, quiet amen. But apparently, apparently, he was loved just as much by my dad as I was. It was crazy. He said, you have no occasion to treat your brother bad. Because when you mistreat him, you mistreat your mom and me. 
And then he did the Walt Nelson thing and said, and you don't want to mistreat me, boy. <laughs> but I say all that to say, what I learned then, I've carried to today and I've realized that they're all of us children of God. And when we mistreat one, we are mistreating God. It's hard. But that's the facts. Love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said. Going on. Going on. What's your motive? What's your motive? See, if you have the means of heaven, you have love. What motivates you? See, most of us, when we go back to the, the core things of our motivation, we're motivated by approval of someone. We're all shaped by the approval that we seek. Some of it's our parents. Some of it's our friends. Today, it's almost all social media. How many likes did you get? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you today have been motivated your entire lives by trying to seek your parents' approval and you've never felt it? How many of you have been motivated by trying to seek the approval of maybe a spouse but never had it? I can't tell you how many of our young people have poured themselves in to try and seek the approval of X's and O's, digital things, media, likes and dislikes. People actually commit suicide. Young people commit suicide because they didn't get enough likes. It's insane. I'm going to say this once. <laughs> That's not true. I'm going to say it as many times as you need to hear it. Stop trying to get the approval of, from someone or something that cannot give it to you. So many of us are trying to fill ourselves and our brokenness with vessels that are broken themselves. Pictures that have empty uh, holes in the bottom. And the more we try and fill, the more empty we fill. We continue and we do all these things trying to get approval of something that we cannot get. Paul, Saul, I should say, Saul was motivated by the approval of the Jews. He was a Greek-speaking Jew. He was not born in Jerusalem. He was looked down on by them. And so when he's sitting there and he's giving their approval to them stoning Stephen, trying to show that, yeah, I'm one of you guys, and he got some, hey, good job, Saul. Thanks for watching our cloaks and stuff. Man, he hit that thing full bore. So I'm going to persecute more people. And the more he persecuted, the more approval he got from them. And the more, and the more, and the more. But here's the thing. He got to the place where he was the chief persecutor for the Israelites. But it always still left him feeling empty and not enough. How do I know? Well, it's simple. He had achieved the highest status he possibly could. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. Okay? He is uh, circumcised on the eighth day. He has all of the accolades. He has gotten letters of commendation and approval and authority from the temple to go to synagogues and drag people out of their houses and throw them in the jail and stone them. All the power he could possibly want. But Jesus steps into his life. And he walks away from all of it. He loses their approval. He loses their authority. He loses his position. He loses everything. And guess what? It didn't matter. Because he found all he needed in the approval of Jesus. Let's listen to Paul's own words on this. Philippians. 3, 4, and 9. Paul is speaking to a governor. Oh, that's an accident. No, Philippians 3, 4, and 9. All right, Paul's talking about his conversion story. His, 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 uh, the, the flesh that he used to take so much pride in. 
you know, the approval that he used to seek. He says, if anybody thinks um, they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. See, he's laying out his lineage, very important to the Jews. A Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. He had become a, a Pharisee. Pharisees were responsible not just for keeping the law perfectly, but for making sure everybody else did. His whole life trying to seek the approval to show that he was Jew enough to be accepted by the Jews. A Pharisee has for zeal, I persecuted the church. Has for legalistic righteousness and reasoning, I was faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Jesus Christ. What is more, I consider everything loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, whose sake I have lost all things and consider them rubbish that I may know Christ. If you've been like Paul, seeking to fill yourself with broken vessels, stop. You don't need to do that anymore. You've already been accepted. But I'm broken. You've been accepted. But I sinned. I've been, you've been accepted. But you don't understand. I am still struggling. You've been accepted by Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. Is that enough? Because if that's enough for you, then the rest of your life is pure joy. You will have trials. You will have tribulations. The world will hate you. They will seek to destroy you. You will lose many of the things that the world seems valuable, but you will have joy. But if it's not enough, if the fact that Jesus Christ has accepted you as his own, where you are, in spite of everything you've ever done, and you still need someone or something else's approval, nothing will ever be enough. And you can get all of the degrees and all of the money and all the accolades, and all the power, and everything you ever thought you needed to be happy, and you will still be empty. If you've been feeling empty, maybe it's because you've been living for the approval of the broken. Maybe it's time you stop trying to get their approval and realize that you've already got everything you need. If you found that to be true in your life today, let me hear you say, he's enough. Yeah. I have a little illustration I want to put with it. Now, should I give it Monty? For me, I've early on found that I had to find, you know, uh, acceptance in uh, myself. Just be happy with it myself. You know what I mean? Um, I, that's why oftentimes, maybe like today, you, I, I address ways that people say, why is he thinking? Because I don't care. You know, that's the way I like to look. You don't like it? That's okay. But I started cooking recently, and what I've, I found within cooking a need for approval. And it's, it's kind of weird, right? And it's like, you know, like, like I, 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 I love, like, cooking, like, like sandwiches. It's, it's dude cooking, okay? Don't, don't get, you know, excited about, like, like, you know, flambés or, you know, uh, whatever. You know, you know, it's, it's dude cooking sandwiches and, um, I don't know, what else do I cook besides sandwiches? You know, casseroles, maybe something. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, spaghetti. Um, but but, but it, it's big to me, right? And, 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 and I'm always, like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll cook it. I'll spend, like, you know, all my, putting my effort and, and I'll, I'll give it to, and I'll just wait like this, like a puppy needing a morsel of approval. Did you like it? Did you like it? And, you know, before they even eat it sometimes, I'll, how is it? I, I haven't tried it yet, but I'm sure it's good. Now, what I found, though, was the one person's approval that I really, really desperately wanted, because she's the one I really started, was my daughter's, you know? Maddie especially, because Sophie was like, oh, daddy, it's good, I love it. That's great, oh, thank you, Sophie, you're awesome. 
But Maddie, Maddie, my college student, she refused to get, she's always like this, mm. Well, well, well did, did it need more butter? Mm -hmm. How about more salt? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but how about a little pepper, maybe? A little yeah, the spices? It mm. always like it drove me crazy. I always like trying, okay, maybe I eat two eggs and maybe the cheese in between the I do egg sandwiches. They're delicious. If you ever want to try them and come over one day, I'll make you one. Anyway, uh, you know, maybe just uh, maybe the way I put it, got croissant versus sourdough, gotta figure out which one's best. And every time she'll always be like, hmm. It was driving me crazy until one day I noticed something about her. She doesn't chew her food. Okay, she's an athlete. So her reason for eating is different than most people's reason for eating. She just needs to get food in her belly because she's always starving. And so she has this thing where she unhinges her jaw and just <laughs> consumes the food at once. I, mean, I will literally be just finishing making someone else's sandwich and I'll look up and she's eating both of hers. And throwing it away, I'm like, what? I don't this is no savoring. And it dawned on me, you've been seeking the approval of this one person who literally does not taste your food because they could care less. <laughs> Just go straight from hand to stomach. <laughs> and how many of us have been like that in our lives? Seeking the approval of someone who could not care less. They just want to take it from us. Fill their belly with it and walk on. Be left alone. But there is one. His name is Jesus. And before you make him anything, he's already approved you for who you are. Finally, finally, talk about the means and the motive. Talk about the opportunity. Have you taken the opportunity today to die to self? Or the opportunity that dying to self affords you? Saul, Paul, Saul's journey started with Stephen's murder. Paul's journey started with the murder of himself. As he came into the presence of Jesus Christ, and he realized something was different. He died to self and lived, lived. In Jesus. And all of a sudden, his world became new. There's something so important about understanding what it means to die to self. About what it means to not go back to the scene of the crime. Do you hear what I'm saying? As I said earlier, some people, they like to kill themselves. But not all the way, right? Keep themselves a little bit on on life support. Go back to it every now and again. I've heard a story, and uh, it could or couldn't, you know, be 100% accurate, but for the purposes of this illustration, it is accurate. Uh, Romans, one of their ways of, of, of uh, penalizing and punishing people was to chain a dead corpse to them. Oftentimes it said the murder victim would, or the murderer would have their uh, victim chained to them. And as the victim decayed, the decaying flesh would poison the good flesh. And anybody who would try and free them from that, uh, they had the penalty of death put upon them. And so they had to walk around with a decaying corpse upon them until they themselves became a decaying corpse. Pretty disgusting, isn't it? But that's what we do to ourselves. For all of us who have come to Jesus and he's cut the corpse off of us. He said, you can now be free. You have the opportunity to live the life of heaven. The life you've always been called to live. The life I created you for. And we go back and we strap that old dead body on us. We drag it around and say, oh, woe is me. You don't have to do that. When you die to self, the only way you can die to self is by accepting Jesus Christ. And when you accept Jesus Christ, you have the power to walk free. Somebody say, I've got the power. Say, I'm free. The 
is a power to be free from your shame, power to be free from death, power to be free from brokenness, power to be free from pride and anger and hurt, power to live in Jesus Christ. Don't miss the opportunity to live in that power. You have the choice. And sometimes the devil, you know, dresses up the old flesh, the rotting corpse, like a brownie or something. And, oh, that looks tasty. I want to go to it. I'll just try and strap it back on. Don't. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. You have the power to be free. Jesus, Paul says in Galatians 5, 2, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. As Paul is put in prison and he's brought before a king, he has a um, story to tell him about the man he used to be and the man he is. Paul telling the story to the king says, uh, on one of these journeys I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you kick against the goads. You see, God was trying and trying to reach Saul, to set him free, but Saul kept kicking against it, trying to get away from him. He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus Christ you are persecuting. And the Lord replied, and I want, if any of you are here today, if, I, if you're someone who's already like, you know, I'm fine, I'm free, I've murdered self, I'm doing good, well then just, you know, listen to the pretty music playing and don't worry about it. But if you're someone who's still struggling, going back and forth, leaning for the corpse and then leaning for Jesus and not quite sure what to do, I'm telling you right now, you don't have to do this. Listen to this next part that Paul says. The Lord replied, now get up and stand on your feet. Have you been knocked down by sin? Have you been knocked down by shame? Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ's commission to you is get up and stand. He says, I have appointed you as a servant and a witness to what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, so that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and a place among those who are sanctified in faith by me. Now, how could he say this to someone who is on his way to persecute people who is in his own sin because God has already forgiven him and given him the power to stand and walk. And he's done that for you. You have the power. You have the power. Be free. Stand. Father in heaven, Thank you so much for giving us the means in which to love you, to love those around us, for giving us the opportunity to choose you and for being the only motive we need. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, if there be anybody here today who is still struggling with letting their old self die, Lord, let them know that there is a new self in you that is greater than anything they could ever imagine and that can finally find fulfillment if they but kill their flesh and accept your spirit. I lift them up to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a couple of quick announcements.